I have two bins full of scrap cakes, so to speak, um, and scrap yarn. Well, hello there. I'm Kristen, also known as Bull and Vine, uh, here on my YouTube channel, on Ravelry, on Instagram, and pretty much everywhere else on the interwebs. And as always, I'm so happy that you're taking some time out of your day to chat about all the knitting, all the sewing, all the making, or whatever crafty rabbit hole I happen to be diving down this week. If you are a new viewer, welcome to my channel. I'm so happy that you're here. However, I would just kind of give a little heads up that this is not the normal, this is not going to be the normal format of my podcast. Uh, if you would like to get a general idea of what my episodes are like, I will link to the previous episode up here in the doobly-doo uh, that uh, you can check out and that will kind of give you an idea of what my normal format is. But today is a very special episode. We are doing a Ask Me Anything episode in which I answer your questions. Uh, last week I asked you to leave some questions in the comments below and I would do my best to answer them uh, in the following episode for, for this very special Ask Me Anything episode. So the original plan was to publish the Ask Me Anything episode last week uh, because that because last week was Thanksgiving here in the States. Uh, so by the way, happy Thanksgiving to everyone who celebrated. I hope you got to spend some time with family, friends, and ate some delicious yummy food. Uh, Dennis and I went up to visit his brother in Pennsylvania as we usually do every year. Uh, so that was really fun. We you know got to get out of the city, see your niece and nephew and see some family and yeah it was just a really overall great time so uh, I hope you guys got to enjoy the same uh, but yes I'm, I, I'm back this week with the AMA episode uh, thank you so much for your patience I just had uh, while I did want to publish it last week there was just a lot going on and you know choose my battles wisely I decided to postpone it to the following week so anyway we are back. I am back. <laughs> and it feels like forever and a day since I podcasted. So let's see if I remember how to do this. But uh, I just want to say thank you so much to everybody who posted your questions in uh, the previous episodes, comments, thread. I had so much fun reading through them. Uh, there, were, there were quite a lot, I think close to 400 questions in there, which Thank you. I mean, you know, I'm excited you guys want to know so much about me. Um, but obviously I can't answer all of those questions. So I went through, uh, picked out the, you know, some frequently asked questions, consolidated them, uh, and picked out some that uh, stood out to me. Uh, some are some are repeat questions, uh, but I feel like there are a bunch of new viewers. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to give a quick, you know, pithy recap of uh, those answers. Uh, but, you know, I will, of course, link to previous FAQ episodes in case you want to check those out. But anyway, let's get into the nitty gritty of it. But I decided to do this episode to celebrate 21K subscribers. I it, it, it blows my mind uh, that that many people are tuning in and I'm, I'm just incredibly thankful for that and I'm and it's because of you that I record every week and look forward to recording every week and it's it it makes me so happy and I'm so lucky to be part of an amazing community of knitters and makers that continually inspire me and just oh uh, yeah but anyway it means the world to me that you guys are hanging out with me every week and I want to you know give you guys a thank you so um, unfortunately as I mentioned in a previous episode I cannot give you guys all a puppy <laughs> uh, that, that would just be impossible but I did want to give a small giveaway to one of you lovely viewers so I whipped up a project bag uh, using some fabric that I really liked that I stumbled on on fabric.com and whipped up a project bag for one of you lovely viewers and it is fabric by, Ale I'm gonna say Alexander Henry, I think that's the manufacturer, uh, but they do this series called The Ghastlies, uh, where you have all these kind of Edward, I wanna say Edward Gorey-esque characters, um, up, you know, just up to their shenanigans. And this theme, uh, we have sewing, so we have this ghoulish looking woman at her sewing machine with her pin cushion, and of course there's a cat with some yarn balls, and on the other side, we have some children uh, imprisoning a, a tailor, it looks like, I want to say, under a mannequin. Uh, yeah, so they're up to no good, but you have like some spool, you have some thread here, some buttons, uh, and yeah, some notions. And then on the inside, you have all of your ghastly notions and whatnot. So it's lined and, you know, it's it's got a mauve zipper because... 
because mauve. I had a lot of fun sewing this up and I actually made one for myself. It's currently housing a, um, a sweater project that I'll talk about in next, week, in next week's episode. Uh, but yeah, this one is for one of you lovely viewers and I will announce the winner at the end of the episode. Uh, but without further ado, let's get on to the questions. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes in design, business, tech, and more, even sewing in the fiber arts. I love learning new things when it comes to knitting, sewing, photography, or whatever crafty rabbit hole I happen to be diving down. And because I know you love learning new things too, I partnered up with Skillshare and they are offering my viewers two months free to try their platform. So give Skillshare a go and learn something new. Just click on the link in the description box below, entering the code at checkout, and enjoy! And thanks Skillshare! Okay. And I categorize these by topic and whatnot. So we're gonna we're gonna talk knitting first. Uh, so the first question is, how did you learn to knit? I learned to knit when I was in I want to say second grade. I was eight years old and. Uh, uh, my school had an after-school program and you got to choose different you can choose from like different electives and whatnot and there was one class called needles and thread and that's one that really stood out to me I could have taken science I could have taken gymnastics I could have taken tennis needles and thread is what I wanted to do so that's what I did and this lovely little French lady um, I don't remember her name but she had the most brilliant heavy French accent uh, you could think of and she would just show up in these really cute little outfits and everything and she was so sweet and you know she taught me and a group of other uh, girls how to um, it was an all-girls school by the way so <laughs> uh, it was just it was just girls hanging out after school uh, learning to knit learning how to sew and embroider and yeah I took to it really quickly and thankfully my grandmother and my aunt uh, knew how to knit so when I was home and I would visit them on the weekend Weekends, uh, I would take my knitting project with me and you know give it to either my grandmother or my aunt and you know ask them to switch colors for me and um, so yeah I had a lot of fun in that class and unfortunately when that class ended uh, the knitting stopped as well but it somehow worked its way into my life here and there you know I would start I would pick it up and then I would get busy and then drop it again and I didn't become a hardcore knitter with a you know with a capital K until I want to say when Ravelry came about. Um, when I got wind of Ravelry, I was laid off from my job and I stumbled into a 99 cent store and saw like this ginormous bin of <laughs> gorgeous peacock colored chenille yarn. Um, I just got so excited. I bought a couple skeins, brought it home and dug up my uh, straight, like my first pair of hot pink knitting needles that I got from a kit and you know, just started browsing the web for knitting patterns and stumbled on Ravelry and the rest was history. I, I want to say it's it's always been in my life knitting because my great grandmother uh, was a hardcore knitter. Uh, I remember going to Germany with my grandmother over summer break when you know because I didn't want to go to summer camp. So my mom's like, "Well, you're going to Germany with your grandma. I'll go." <laughs> sure, twist my arm. Uh, and I just remember my great grandmother sitting there in the corner, constantly knitting away on a pair of socks. Um, and yeah, it's unfortunately, I ha didn't have the urge or inclination to knit at the time, but I just always remember her sitting there in the corner knitting. Um, and today, to this day, I really wish that I could have shared some knitting time with her and you know, we could have bonded over that. Uh, that would have been just, yeah. I mean, if I, could, if I could knit with anyone, dead or alive, it would be my great grandmother. Clara, uh, wherever you are, um, yeah. So anyway, <laughs> uh, that is, that's how I learned to knit. And that was a really long answer. How long have you gone without knitting or sewing? <gasps> As I mentioned, I am a knitter with a capital K. If I go a day without knitting, I am not a happy camper. I get cranky. I just feel like something's missing from my day. I think at most, I think a day without knitting. Um, usually it's it's something that I just naturally do every single day just because I love it so much. If Dennis and I are on vacation and we don't have a lot of downtime or you know, constantly sightseeing or whatever, then you know I might go a day or two without knitting. As far as sewing, I've gone days without sewing. Uh, knitting is definitely my first love. So um, I, I am, Okay, I'm okay going a couple days without sewing because let, let's 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 be honest. Sewing is an event. You have to lay out your fabric, you have to cut out the fabric, you have to pin things. Knitting is just something you can pick up and put down when, at at your at your leisure. Yeah, sewing my my sewing machine back there. Um, 
it's a it's a Janome. I always get asked this quite a lot. Uh, my sewing machine is a Janome 2212, uh, and then I have a serger, which is a brother a brother lock 1034d so for those of you that are curious i did an episode all about my sewing machine and i will of course post that a link to that episode right up here so in case you're curious actually no i lied i have gone maybe two weeks without knitting because i remember i had um I need. I, I cut. I had a really bad accident with my hand where I needed 11 stitches. Uh, I was washing dishes in the sink and a glass broke as I was washing it. And yeah, it's it's gross. I'm sorry, um, but like I sliced my my hand open right here and I needed 11 stitches. I had to go to the emergency room, got 11 stitches, and I was pretty much dead in the water as a knitter for about a good two weeks. It was a really tough time, but you know, thank, thanks to the knitting community, you all gave me some really wonderful ideas as far as. Uh, what you know I could do to pass the time like be it organizing my Ravelry queue my my Ravelry stash taking photos of my stash and you know just being really supportive and helpful you know trying to get me through the tough days but uh, yeah I will say two weeks because of my hand stitches uh, that that's how long I've gone without without knitting. Number three, is there any yarn in your stash that is too precious to use? A yarn that you love so much but can't find the perfect pattern. Yes, that would be <laughs> this skein of Layla Bella. It's soft cashmere exclusive for Layla Bella yarn shop in Venice, Italy. So this skein of yarn I picked up when Dennis and I traveled to Italy. We were in Venice and I stopped by Layla Bella, a really, really cute, um, tiny but mighty yarn shop in Venice. Uh, it's their house, house yarn. It's made specifically for their yarn shop. It's 100% cashmere. <laughs> So you can see why why I'm being very precious about it. And it's da, 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 has a, 770 yards, uh, 700 meters. So there's a lot of yardage in here, and it is it is so incredibly soft. And I'm just yeah, I'm holding out. I'm holding out, guys. Um, although it's it's a shame that it's just sitting in my stash, and I you know I really should just I should really just find a pattern for it and knit with it and enjoy it. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's just got so much memories of that trip in here that, I don't know, I, I can't bring myself to, to dip into it. But uh, yeah, this is my special yarn. Next question. Have you ever tried to teach your husband how to knit? Yes, and I will never do it again. He's just not that into knitting. <laughs> Next question. What pattern would you suggest for a first time color work knitter? I would actually recommend the Hoopla Hat by Diana Walla. I recently knit this pattern and I really, really enjoy knitting it. It uses worsted weight yarn and the, it just holds your interest. There are several motifs and they're all different. So you definitely get a feel for carrying the yarn, uh, carrying your floats and whatnot. Um, so just an all around great pattern. Uh, and if you want, you know, once you've knit that and you want to up the ante a little bit, definitely give uh, Skein Deer's Selbu Mittens a try. It uses DK weight and they're just such a fun quick knit. And yeah, the, those are definitely very beginner color work friendly, very color work beginner knitter friendly. So I, I hope that helps. Where is your favorite place to knit? Truth be told, sitting in front of my computer watching podcasts. Honorable mention, sitting in the car next to Dennis in the passenger seat. And yeah, I th honestly, that's about it. Not very exciting answers. What do you do with all of your scrap yarn? Well, honestly, I amass quite a bit of scrap yarn due to a bunch of false project starts. Like I'll start a project and then decide I don't want to knit it. And then I'm left with a cake that I have no idea what to do. And nine out of 10, those cakes end up in this bin right here, times two. So <laughs> I have, I have two bins full of scrap cakes, so to speak, um, and scrap yarn, but that's what I that's what I do with it. And they live inside of my um, my IKEA Expedit shelf unit. So that is where my scrap yarn lives. How do you reply when relatives ask you to knit stuff for them? Honestly, none of my relatives ask me to knit things for them, uh, with the exception of Dennis. He is very knit worthy. I know he wears the socks that I knit him, the hats that I knit for him, but I honestly don't get many requests from rel relatives asking me to knit things for them. Um, if I do knit for them, it's because I want to. However, my mom, my mother, is really good at, or really known for stealing my knitwear. So if I show up to their house and she likes one of my 
my one of my hand knit garments or accessories, she will ask me if she can keep them. And I sometimes I've learned my lesson. I've gifted them to my mother. However, I never see her wearing them. So I, I've gotten very good at just saying, nope, it's mine. You can't have it. Obligation knitting, I never finish the project. Um, case in point, Dennis volunteered me to knit friends a baby blanket. And while I was all game for the idea, I really wanted to. The fact that I had an obligation to knit this thing, um, I just, it, it was just a disaster waiting to happen. I did not complete it. I frogged the pattern. It's, it's not happening. Unfortunately, they're not receiving any knitwear from me anytime soon. Although I'm not gonna say I'm never going to do it. It's just, I'm not gonna knit an entire baby blanket. Let's just put it that way. How long would you say you knit on an average day? Uh, if I'm lucky, I get at least an hour to knit <laughs> uh, during the week. On the weekends, I would say I knit at least for four hours at a time, uh, just because, you know, lately Dennis has been studying and I've had all this time to craft on the weekends, which has been really lovely. Uh, so on the weekends, I would say about maybe four, four hours of knitting. Uh, and during the week about, I would say like one to two hours, um, a little bit in the morning, a little bit during the day, during lunch. And then at the end of the day, when I'm all done working, I would say I get a good, I get a good two hours. And who or what inspires your knitting projects? I would say a lot of a lot of people and things inspire me. Uh, mainly, I, I want to say when it comes to podcasts, Ellie from Skeeter Knits just the fact that she is able to just cast on with reckless abandon and finish these beautiful garments and color work. It's definitely inspiration to me to like just cast on, you know, whatever whatever strikes me at the moment. I find the whole knitting community inspires me all at once. So be it, you know, me browsing on Instagram and seeing a project that I really like, um, a, a hand dyer that dyes really beautiful yarn, not just my own, um, or, you know, just brow, yeah. I, I gain inspiration from a lot of different sources, especially browsing Ravelry. You know, you have those days where you just fall down the, the, the Ravelry rabbit hole. A lot of people have Facebook. I have Ravelry. So <laughs> you fall down the scrolling rabbit hole and then you're like, ooh, I wanna knit that, ooh, I wanna knit that. And before you know it, your cart is loaded up with all these patterns and you're casting on all the things. So yeah. Okay, moving along to business questions, because if you're not familiar, I am the hand dyer behind Villain Vine Yarns, my hand dyed yarn company, uh, and I'm gonna answer some questions related to that. So, the first one is, how did you start your business? What did you do before dyeing yarn? Before I became a yarn dyer, I was actually, believe it or not, a video editor. <laughs> so clearly I'm still video editing and involved in filmmaking. Uh, just, I, I realized it's not what I wanna do as a career. I love the art of it, just not what I wanna do for a living. Uh, but yeah, I was a video editor for a major news corporation here in New York City, uh, a company which shall remain nameless uh, just for privacy's sake. But uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was pretty exciting exciting, I want to say. Thankfully, you know, it wasn't the cut and dry stuff. Um, it was a little bit of that uh, on the side, but mainly I was in charge of creating content for their online lifestyle magazine. So I got to, uh, you know, explore the more creative side of things, thankfully, and interview uh, quite a few famous people, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, I did get to meet uh, Dita Von Tees, which was one of the highlights. I got to meet the cast of Outlander. <gasps> yeah, that was, that was awesome, but at the end of the day, as an introvert, it was really challenging. I had to deal a lot with PR, um, producing content and scheduling shoots, and uh, obviously interviewing talent. And you know, it, it was it was it, it took a major toll on me. Uh, and I would I would come home feeling really run down, really depressed, uh, and it was just not happening. Even when that was happening, I hadn't discovered yarn dyeing yet. I just knew that I had to get out of that environment. And I always knew that I wanted to start a business for myself and work for myself, be my own boss. I just didn't know, I, I needed to find my niche and I didn't know what that was. Um, but then one day, I, I think thanks thanks to Laura, who used to be the dyer behind Jinx Yarn. She has the Jinx Handmade podcast, uh, which I will link to, of course. Uh, but she used to do some uh, really awesome dyeing tutorials and we had already become friends then and I would watch her tutorials and one day I was home from work feeling you know kind of bored and creative not well not bored you know there's always knitting I, I took the day off to knit but I was feeling you know a little bit um, experimental shall we say that's the word I'm looking for experimental uh, and I decided to try my hand hand dyeing yarn and 
I fell in love with the process immediately and I started ordering blank skeins from Knit Picks and, you know, dyeing all the yarn and pretty soon the skeins started piling up and I had no idea what I was going to do with all these skeins. So what do you do? You you, you list them on Etsy. And lo and behold, uh, because I had a podcast, I was already podcasting for several years and uh, you know, I had a decent following. Uh, it was easy for me to get the word out to my viewers like, hey, I, I dyed all this yarn. Here's what it looks like. Um, if you are interested, I'm gonna put it on Etsy for sale. And lo and behold, people were interested and they bought the yarn and they wanted more. And long story short, uh, you know, it got to a point where I was moonlighting. I had a side hustle of dyeing yarn. I would come home from work, dye yarn and spend my weekends dyeing yarn. And I realized I, I couldn't keep up both. I had to choose one or the other and it was a really easy decision for me. Um, I, you know, obviously didn't quit my job right there and then. I, I wanted to be smart about it. Uh, I, I sat down with Dennis, we went over the numbers and decided, okay, well, um, you know, I'm gonna take a year, I'm gonna work one more year at my current job and save up enough money, pay off all my college loans, tuition, any outstanding debt that I had. Thankfully, uh, after a year, I, I did that and um, you know, I didn't burn any bridges at my past company. You know, they, I have to say like, I had really amazing coworkers. I learned so much from them. Uh, and you know, no, no hard feelings. Just, it, it just wasn't the position for me. And it, it's a, an environment that I didn't want to grow anymore in. Uh, and I was really, the day that I walked into my boss's office and gave my two weeks notice, I was sweating bullets. Uh, but that was a really, really awesome day for me. And I want to say that was about four years ago. Um, and after that I, I went full time with, with Volan Vine Yarns. Haven't looked back. It was the best decision I ever made alongside getting married. But anyway, <laughs> so uh, yeah, that that is how I started Bull and Vine Yarns. What is a typical day like? It varies from day to day, depending on what needs my attention most. But on a typical day, when it's just me uh, working, because uh, my uh, I have Emily, who is Slow Fashion Rebel. She helps me out two times a week to package yarn, uh, and then also on Thursdays to dye yarn uh, while I edit edit the podcast. She comes in and, uh, you know, she's, she's amazing. Um, I don't know what I would do without her. But on a typical day, when and it's just me. Uh, I generally wake up around 6 a.m. in the morning. I love waking up early. I'm an early riser, morning person. <laughs> Call me crazy. Dennis still thinks I'm crazy for waking up early. Um, but you know, I make myself breakfast, I make myself some coffee, come to my craft room, this area right here, um, and I just, you know, have a little quiet time to myself. I journal. Um, I plan out my day, figure out what needs to get done, and I then maybe answer some emails, catch up on social media, get a little knitting done on a project, uh, and then you know Dennis leaves for work around like nine, and you know I'm I'm still working here for about maybe an hour, answering emails and catching up on things. Um, and then I will go down to the dye dungeon uh, about maybe around like 9, 30, 10 o'clock. Uh, the dye dungeon is my dye studio. I lovingly call it, call it the dye dungeon because it is in the basement. Um, and then that is where I will tie up some skeins that I plan on dyeing later. Uh, I, I tie up maybe about, I do an average of 40 skeins per day. Um, and dye 20 skeins at a time, so two batches. It takes a while. It's, you know, my colorways are very involved, so, you know, it's that's as much as I can handle on a day, on a single given day. Um, but if it's like a yarn club, I might do a little more. Um, and then uh, once the yarn is tied up and soaking, I then skein and label any yarn from the previous day. Uh, and, you know, that can take up anywhere from like an hour to two hours. Uh, and then I'll have some lunch and then catch up on more emails, more social media. I will take photos of yarn, do, you know, a little, um, you know, planning as far as like what the rest of my week is going to look like, uh, you know, and, you know, obviously do some more social media posting, photo editing, uh, working on the newsletter, uh, which I send out every week. And, you know, so there's that, there's a lot of admin stuff involved. <laughs> so, you know, and also like sitting down and ordering more stock, uh, doing inventory and whatnot. Um, and then once, you know, all that's done, maybe around one, you know, like, I want to say like two o'clock is when I start dyeing yarn and I will dye yarn all the way until six, seven o'clock sometimes. Um, so yeah. And you know, that, that's, that's pretty much my day, you know, around six, seven o'clock, I put everything down. Uh, you know, I tidy up, 
the studio. I go upstairs, uh, you know, decide what we're doing for dinner. Sometimes if I've been working really hard, I will suggest that we get takeout. Um, or go out, I will meet Dennis for dinner or something. Uh, yeah, and the rest of the day I have to knit, you know, the rest of the night. Um, and then I go to bed maybe about 11.30. Yeah, so <laughs> 11.30, sometimes 12 o'clock. But anyway, that, that is a typical day. Can you talk about your creative process in creating new colorways? Do you see them in your mind first or do you get inspired by photos, etc.? Um, I would say my colorways are inspired by uh, things that I'm into. Uh, normally I don't name them until after the colorway has been dyed, but I have an idea of things that I'm drawn to. I'm definitely drawn to darker darker themes, like gothic themes, uh, like vampires and fairy tales and um, you know, like Halloween especially. Halloween is my favorite holiday. Uh, so th those definitely work their way into names that I give my colorways. Uh, however, when it comes to creating new colorways, uh, sometimes I'll have an idea, but when I play off those ideas, it never turns out the way I expect. Um, or when I, when I use photos as a reference, I don't like doing that because it always turns out not the way I planned or want it to. Um, normally the way I work, when I create a new colorway, I start off with one color. Um, and then gradually add to it. I would say that it's kind of like a layering process. So yeah, just go, going with one color, choosing a color to go with that color and just layering on all the colors and seeing how they all play together. Um, so I would say that is generally my creative process when it comes to creating color. What is your biggest self-employed misstep or learning opportunity when launching Volenvine Yarns? Um, I would, Thankfully, thankfully I don't have many missteps. Um, I kind of, I, I feel like because I gave myself a year to save up and prepare myself to transition from working at a stable company to running my own business, I felt like I hit the ground running, so to speak. When I started Volenvine Yarns, I would just say yes to every single opportunity. And before I knew it, I was burnt out, I was overextending myself and felt, you know, after agreeing to do something or collaborate or what have you, I just regretted it immediately. So nowadays, if I'm not sure about something or, you know, my gut tells me I should hold off on something before saying yes to it, I do that. I, you know, if somebody comes to me with you know wanting to do a collaboration and I'm just not sure I don't know if I have the time I don't say yes right away I either wait to answer the email or I say I need a little more time I need to think about it or if it's just something that I know isn't a good match or a good collaboration or it's something that just doesn't sit right with me I just say no um, and I don't feel guilty about it it's just you know you, you got to stick to your guns uh, and you should not say you should not feel guilty about declining collaborations. You know, it's it's not about, you know, you can't be worried about offending people. It's just you have to think about what's good for you and your business at the end of the day. Um, you know, it's not like you're trying to offend anybody. You, you just, you know, you, you gotta prioritize. So uh, yeah, I would say, I wish I said no more in the beginning. How do you manage your time to accomplish so much? Knitting, sewing, dyeing, etc. Work-life balance. <laughs> Oh gosh, um, yeah, I, I really don't know. I don't even think there's a work-life balance involved and I, I'm, still, I'm still working towards a better plan um, because I will be honest, uh, case in point last week, I was feeling incredibly burnt out. Um, I, you know, if I'm feeling burnt out or if I'm feeling really stressed, I tell myself to stop what I'm doing, stop working, take a deep breath and do something that I enjoy for a little bit. Um, you know, if, if I feel like I haven't gotten much knitting done, I will look at my schedule and say, you know what? I don't have to dye yarn today. I dyed a lot of yarn. I just need a break. Um, that's just how I work. Um, I try not to compare myself to other yarn dyers in my business because what works for them might not be something that works for me. But I think a key factor is waking up early. Just those extra maybe two, two, three hours in the morning to myself. Um, I managed to get some knitting done. I managed to get all of those little things done that I normally wouldn't be able to do ha if I woke up at nine o'clock. What is your greatest reward as an indie dyer? I would have to say getting to see what customers knit with my yarn. Uh, it, there's nothing more exciting than browsing than browsing Instagram and then spotting someone who's knit a gorgeous shawl or a gorgeous garment out of out of my hand dyed yarn. It just gives me like a rush of I don't know what, but like it just makes me so excited and so happy to see that 
uh, yarn that I've dyed is bringing someone else so much joy and you know creativity and ah yeah it just that that's my favorite part. How do you come up with your knitting pattern designs? Do you sketch them out first or just start with yarn and needles? Um, I want to. It's weird. Designing patterns is something that is very sporadic for me. I want to say I want to do more of it because I really do enjoy designing. Um, but. It, Lately, when I design a pattern, it's just something that I wake up one day and say, I feel like designing a pattern. <laughs> so I just kind of pull out all of my stitch dictionaries and flop through them and find like a stitch that pops out at me, something that inspires me. And then if I find a stitch that I'm really liking or drawn to, I will kind of, you know, mull it over in my mind, look at my yarn, see what colors and yarn is speaking to me. And then I'll just kind of, you know, get an idea of like a shape, both casting on, and designing at the same time. I really can't explain it. So it's something that just kind of happens in tandem, so to speak, um, but that's generally how my patterns come together. How do you stay inspired as a podcaster? Every Friday is a lot and you do it so well. Thank you. <laughs> I'm very curious to know what motivates and inspires you. Um, well, I do this for fun. I podcast because it's fun to share what I'm making. Uh, I originally started podcasting because I wanted a way to connect with the knitting community. I look at it as a part, as an extension of my, you know, my job as a yarn dyer and fiber artist. Uh, it's just consistency is something that's important to me and something that I value. But as far as staying inspired, just, you know, whatever patterns are inspiring me at the moment, whatever I'm working on, because, you know, I, I, I knit every day. So, you know, I always have something to talk about, you know, progress, struggles I'm having, problems, issues with a pattern, or uh, something that I've learned, something, a new technique that I'm, I'm excited to share with you guys. Um, and, you know, watching other knit, knitting podcasts and sewing podcasts, they inspire me um, and other people in the knitting community. So I just feel like there's a constant flow of inspiration and something, you know, to talk about every week. So I, I hope that answers your question. When you first started podcasting, were you worried you weren't going to gain a following? How long did it take you to build up momentum? Any advice for amateur podcasters? Um, I did an episode, I, I think I talked about this in the last uh, AMA episode. Uh, I went into podcasting not expecting a following. I did it because it was something that I wanted to do for fun uh, as opposed to blogging because let's be honest, I am not the best. Writing is like pulling teeth for me. It doesn't come naturally and I would much rather talk about something and you know show something visually than actually blog about something if that makes sense. So I did it as a way of just documenting my makes from week to week. Uh, and again, I because I did it for fun, I wasn't expecting a following or anything. It's just me participating in the, me, it was just a way for me to participate in the knitting community. And my advice to anyone wanting to start a podcast, don't worry about a following. It's not gonna happen overnight. It certainly didn't happen overnight for me. Uh, you know, I, I wanna say maybe within the past two years, my channel started growing and I started gaining followers. It was a very, very, very slow progression. And because I wasn't concerned about that and I just kept, I, it was just something that I did for fun. Again, keyword is fun here. So I guess my advice to you is if you wanna start a podcast, start the podcast, do it. Put your work out there, put your video out there and don't worry about numbers. Followers will come, just be yourself. Um, and you know, again, Worrying about numbers is the worst thing you can do because you're putting all this pressure on yourself. Um, but just, you know, show up every week or however often that you can. It doesn't have to be every week like I do. Some some podcasters do bi-weekly, they do monthly, and that's totally fine. You have to find a schedule that works for you. Um, but, you know, I would say consistency, be showing up, you know, letting your viewers know when you're going to podcast is definitely key. Um, and showing up because it's, it's kind of like, you know, scheduling, uh, a hangout with a friend, you know, if you say you're gonna you're gonna meet them at a coffee shop at three o'clock and you don't show up, it's kind of a letdown. So I have that in my mind when I, you know, decide when I set out to podcast that I was gonna do this every single week because it's something that I enjoy and I, you know, want to do for my viewers. But again, if you're starting out, just do it. Just jump right in. You, the best camera that you have is the one that you have, be it your smartphone. Uh, and you know, the rest the rest will come, you know? It's like if you get really into it and you wanna upgrade occasionally, uh, you know, then by all means, go for it. But I do say, don't worry about the numbers and then you're like, well, then why are you celebrating 
20K subscribers. Why are you getting all excited about that? I think it's important to celebrate milestones like that. Um, you know, just just to say thank you to just to say thank you to viewers because clearly clearly I'm not talking to myself. Um, it means so much to me that. Uh, you know, you guys keep coming back every week and want to see more and you know want to get you know join the conversation It's it's awesome And I think it's really important to celebrate those milestones milestones when you hit them um, But on a day-to-day -day basis don't be concerned about oh, I didn't gain a follower today Oh, you know, it's like no one's commenting on my video. No one's looking at my video It's the worst thing you can do do it because it's fun 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 Otherwise, what's the point of doing it? What has been the best thing about starting a podcast on YouTube? That would be the community. Uh, again, I started a podcast not having many knitting friends, if at all, uh, and I started the podcast to, you know, I, again, connect with the knitting community. And my very first friend that I made through podcasting was Maria of Cables and Crewnecks. Maria, if you were watching, you were amazing. I love you. Um, and yeah, we're, we are still friends to this day. Uh, after Maria, it was Lara, who lives in Texas. and. These days, it's like I am connected to so many knitters around the world. It's it's crazy uh, in, in the most wonderfulest way possible. It, that is that language? I don't know. It's so surreal to know that I have a knitting friend in London. I have a knitting friend in France. I have a knitting friend in Texas or Canada, and their knitters are everywhere. But it's so cool to know, like I could travel anywhere and just connect with a knitter that I've been chatting with online and say, hey, I'm gonna be in your town, you wanna meet up, or, and vice versa. Um, it's, it's meeting so many creative and inspiring people in this community has been like the most rewarding part about podcasting. All right, we, we are winding down. This is gonna be a long episode, guys. <laughs> we are moving down to life in general. So these are basic life questions. How did you find yourself in Brooklyn? And if you didn't live there, where would you want to live? So I am a hardcore Brooklynite. I was born and raised in Brooklyn. Uh, I've never lived anywhere else in my life other than moving to Manhattan uh, when I was seven and then moving back to Brooklyn after college. Uh, and yeah, I, you know, I tell myself sometimes growing up, I was like, I could never move away from Brooklyn. It's, I love it. It's just, it's my home. However, I do find myself daydreaming about possibly moving to Europe. I would, I would love, love to move to London or Edinburgh. It's, as far as the States, I'm really not sure where I would want to live otherwise. Um, I, I toyed with the idea, Dennis and I talk about maybe possibly moving to Maine because it's absolutely beautiful up there, but I don't know. I'm, I'm too much of a city girl. Like I can't do the country. I can't do suburbia. I can't. I like being able to roll out of bed and go to a store right around the corner if I need anything. Um, yeah. So I don't know. But I, I I love the city. How old is Bella, and where did you get her? Bella, goose. How old are you? We believe Bella is about maybe seven years old. We adopted her from this place when we were living in Greenpoint, Brooklyn for some time and there was a pet store around the corner called the Muddy Paws, not around the corner from us, but in the neighborhood uh, called the Muddy Paws and they were doing a cat adoption. And Dennis came home one day and he's like, Chrissy, you gotta see these, these cats that they have for adoption. Uh, so we took a little walk and Bella was sitting there in the window and you know, just being Bella and I fell in love with her fluffy, fluffy tail and she was, she was a lot smaller at the time and I just picked her up and she didn't want to come out of the cage. She just had like her claws. She was like holding on for dear life to the cage that she was in and we eventually kind of like, you know, coaxed her to let go a little bit and I swear I held her for about 45 minutes and a couple walked into the pet store, pet store and they, they saw me holding her and they're like, you're not leaving here without that cat. And I just knew like she was, she was like, she had the she has the best personality. Like I could hold her. She wasn't you know getting all angsty. She was very chill, and I was like, I need I need this cat in my life. And you know Dennis really liked her too. And that night they you know after we filled out some papers and uh, you know we gave them some references. Uh, they they brought her over uh, to our apartment. And yeah, the rest is history. Do you usually say uh as much as you do on the podcast? Uh... And we are down to the very last question. This has been a long episode, guys. <laughs> so anyway, I hope, you, I hope you're still here. Thank you for bearing with me. But uh, this is the last question and the winner of the giveaway prize. Uh, and I used a random uh, comment picker. It's a website. I will link to it down below. Uh, but yeah, basically chose a random comment from the last episode's comment section uh, and 
without further ado, the winner of, the winner of, the winner of, what did I do with the, the giveaway? Oh, it's behind me, it's behind me. But yes, the winner of this handmade project bag that I whipped up with blood, sweat, and tears. I'm kidding, it was made with love and the best of my crafting abilities <laughs> uh, for one of you viewers that I appreciate so much. Uh, however, only one person can win it and I will also pack some goodies in, as well. It won't just be the project bag. But the winner of the project bag is Snellish Knits. Congratulations, Snellish Knits. Uh, very well deserved. And thank you to everyone who left me a question in last week's episode. It was just so fun reading through all of your questions and picking and choosing the ones for the episode. And if you didn't have your question answered on the episode, I promise I will do more AMA episodes. But Snellish Knits wants to know, and this is actually a really awesome question. Uh, so it's very, you know, I, I like the question. Uh, she asks, if you weren't a yarn dyer, what would you, what would, if you weren't a yarn dyer, what would be your dream job? Oh, um, I can't imagine life without knitting in it. Um, definitely in the fiber arts. Uh, I definitely want a job, you know, either being a knitwear designer or, um, you know, if it couldn't be knitting related at all, um, I would totally want to be a photographer. I'm falling in love with it every single day, like learning something new, new techniques, watching more tutorials. I could totally see myself doing the whole photographer thing. Um, but you know, even if it is fiber related there, I feel like I could be a knitwear photographer. I think there, there's a market for that as well. So, you know, but anyway, thank you so much, Snailish Knits. Please contact me. Uh, send me an email at contact at Volenvine Yarns, letting me know that you saw this and you're the winner and let me know your shipping address and I will mail this project bag to you as soon as I can. Um, yay, so congrats, congrats, congrats. Uh, and yeah, so. <sighs> okay guys, that is the AMA episode. Uh, hopefully I get to do another one again soon, um, you know, maybe for the next milestone. I will be back next week with a regular episode uh, for you and I uh, can't wait to show share with you what I've been working on because yeah, it'll, it'll be a lot to catch you up on. But there is that and uh, if you are curious, I am having a shop update this weekend. I forget the date exactly, but I'll pop it in the down bar, villainvineyarns.com. Uh, I will have more cider, uh, sparkling cider hat kits available, which by the way, if you guys purchased a copy of my sparkling cider hat, my new knitting pattern, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, it went over so well, it was so well received, um, and you know, it just blows my mind. So thank you so much. I hope you're all enjoying the knit. Uh, and yeah, again, more kits in the shop this weekend. I hope you can make it. Uh, and if you want to be in the loop about what other colorways uh, are going to be in the shop, sign up for my newsletter. I send it out every Friday or Saturday. Um, sign up at villainvineyarns.com and just enter your email. And every week, once a week, I'll send out a newsletter letting you know what the details are for shop updates and the like. So uh, that said, I'm gonna end things there. If you guys enjoyed this episode, uh, please like and subscribe below. I put out an episode every week on Fridays. Uh, and yeah, if you're, if you're into that type of thing. So that said, happy knitting, and I will see you next time. Bye.